took me from the womb. You made me trust you at your mother's, my mother's breast. And on you I was cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaw. You lay me in the dust of the earth. It goes on and closes from verse 29. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Every, even the one who could not keep himself alive, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Let's pray as we open up our service. Lord, as we read this psalm, we, we get a sense of its messianic uh, prophecy. It's pointing to uh, that time when you approached the cross, rejected by men, scorned, uh, you were hated and mocked. And yet here we see this promise at the end that all will bow down one day before you in worship. That all, even these future generations, will proclaim your righteousness even to a people yet unborn. Lord, would you help us to be worshipers first? Would you help us to be people who know you and love you and worship you and tell of you to an unborn generation yet to come. Lord, would you help us tonight as we meet with you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing Jesus Messiah together. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah
consumed by my selfish ways. Then he showed me what it meant to care for others. Shame consumed my mind. My self-worth was in question. Then I looked up, I looked out, I saw the light. Like imagine following someone for all that time, walking with them, learning from them, seeing such incredible things. Then suddenly he's taken away and hung on a cross, all within a few days. Then just like that, gone. really who he said he was? Was hope really gone? But what we didn't know was that he wasn't really gone. He was waiting for what came next. death. He defeated the grave. He secured our freedom. He broke the power of sin. His name was Jesus. He was the Messiah. read the couple of verses that 
Colin is going to come and share with us tonight. Following on from where we were in Mark 11, after Jesus curses the fig tree, we read in verse 15 through to 19. And then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple. He began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Let's pray as Colin comes up to share God's word. Lord, we ask that you would bless us, give us ears to hear, and would you anoint Colin's lips as he shares from your word this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. That was just a test of the microphone. <laughs> and when your son's on the sound desk, then... There's no added pressure on Innes tonight to get this part right. So, as we have heard tonight, as Matthew has read, Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We know from verse 11 in Mark's Gospel that he visited the temple late in the day. He went into the temple, he looked around at everything, and went to Bethany. Jesus would have been shocked at what he saw in the temple, but he reserved his anger that evening for the next day. Jesus coming into Jerusalem during Passover heightened the tension between him and the religious authorities, and we're going to look tonight at one aspect of that. Jesus came back into the temple on the Monday, and I'm going to look at four elements this evening of that. What was the temple, and why were people coming there? Trading in the temple, the temple as a house of prayer for all nations, and the reaction of the chief priests. So, I thought it might be useful, because we hear the temple uttered often, just to paint a bit of a picture for you. And I thought, what better to do than paint a picture in the context of, here we are in Glenorthus. So, temple consisted of a main building with a court around it, just for Israelite men. Then beyond that, a court for Israelite women. And beyond that, by far and away the largest part, a court for the Gentiles. The entire Temple Mount complex was, based on subsequent research, approximately 35 acres. Now, there's a fabulous little tool that I can use in my day job, which allows me to measure acreage. Right, what can I say tonight to give people a scale and size of 35 acres? Now, if you take from where GBC used to worship, at Church Street, taking all of North Street, all the way to St. Columbus, so effectively what we would regard as the town centre of Glenorthus. That's the size of an area that we are talking that the temple would be. So, when Jesus entered the temple, what he found was something that many of us, I'm sure, will have experienced on holiday over the years, but one of these kind of bizarre marketplace with hustle and bustle and noise with trade and noise going on of people trying to buy and change money. So, Jesus comes into the temple, and as Matthew has just read, entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Now, John in his gospel tells us that it wasn't just pigeons that were being sold. There were oxen, there were sheep as well. How did Jesus drive them out? He made a whip of cords and drove the sheep and the oxen out. Now, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. Now, that would be quite a scene. If I came down from here tonight and suddenly started throwing tables, I'm fairly certain there would be a bit of a commotion in here. It's okay, Caleb, I'm not going to do it. Your phone is safe in front of you. Don't worry. But there really would. And I guess when you think of animals being whipped, I certainly thought of the, I'm sure we've all seen on television news over the years, the running of the bulls in Pamplona in Spain, something that is televised live 
um, now and has been televised for 35 years, which I find quite remarkable as I was researching for tonight. Now, when the bulls run, you get the crazies that run in front of the bulls. Why? I do not know. But then the crowds are behind fences, so they are standing at the side. They are somewhat protected. Here, there would be no such protection. Suddenly, Jesus is, these animals would be off and running around, and there would be chaos. Now, whilst many of us will have heard of the sacrificial offering of animals throughout the Old Testament, the need for money changers is perhaps something that's worth just pausing to think about for a moment. Exodus 30 verses 13 to 16 talks about the census tax and how people will give. So each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Everybody who's numbered in the census from 20 year olds and upwards shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more than the poor, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. You shall make the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting, that it may bring the people of Israel to a remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. So the taxation system effectively is what supported the, the temple. However, for those who had traveled afar, much like when we go abroad and um, have to exchange into, I was going to say pesetas and lira, but that just ages me, so we'll just call them euros now, uh, then you needed a currency. So people that were traveling who didn't trade in the, the local currency had to change their money into an acceptable currency for the temple. So Jesus gets to the temple and finds people making deals on animals, exchanging money so that people can pay their temple tax. So that got me as a property lawyer thinking, you know, the arrangements that were in place here, these kind of leases, occupational license type arrangements, in many ways are probably what I do day in, day out in my day job. I'm fairly sure some of the arrangements that existed between the high priest and the traders are very similar to arrangements that I've put in place for some of the tenants in the very shopping centre that we are above. Ten the traders presumably had an expectation that they could occupy their space openly and peaceably, free from interference, provided they used that space for the agreed purpose. Provided also, of course, that they paid rent. Um, they also paid additional rent. We call it today turnover, but effectively a commission on the profits that they made. The high priest would have an expectation that the trader paid the rent, carried on the activities that they had permission for, and didn't do anything that interfered with what the religious leaders and those visiting the temple were doing. So, I've already touched on the chaos that I could cause if I turned these tables, but if you think in a shopping centre, then if somebody starts to walk into shops and starts throwing shelves all over the place, that would cause an element of chaos. However, I'm fairly certain when Jesus did this that he didn't whip every animal or turn over every table. Simply starting that process would have caused sufficient chaos that the system would have broken down very quickly. So, if you're a high priest in that situation, I can imagine the indignation that they had, that Jesus is suddenly coming along, turning these tables. People can't pay the tax, so there's no money for them to get. They can't give their sacrificial offering, and they're not getting their income from these traders. However, it's not just the finances associated with this that concern them. It's the fact that people were actually listening to what Jesus had to say to them. So, verse 17 tonight, Jesus is angry because, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus' explanation comes from a couple of Old Testament passages. Isaiah 56, 7, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Jeremiah 7, verse 11, has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? First problem to do with the, 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 the fact that he calls this his house, the, the very function of the house is a house of God. It's not designed to be a place of commerce, but it was to be a place devoted to the worship of God. When the first temple was built, the glory of God filled it. Second Chronicles 7, verses 1 to 3. God promised his people he would meet with them in the temple. He promised to hear the prayers that were prayed in that place. Second Chronicles 7, verses 15 to 16. 
It was to be his house where he alone was to be worshipped. The temple had ceased to be about the Lord. It had become a house that was man-centered, not God-centered. The temple was no longer God's house. It had become a house devoted to the needs of men. And that angered Jesus. House shall be called shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. The temple was designed as a house of prayer. The needy could approach God in that place. The true believer, whether Jew or Gentile, could come to the temple and pray to the Lord. And God promised to hear those prayers. Now, the only place in the temple that the Gentile could approach God had become a marketplace. Imagine the noise. I mentioned earlier the bazaar and the, the, the kind of trade that we've all seen in a marketplace on uh, overseas and holiday. Um, the noise that must have filled the court of the Gentiles. Animals, sellers yelling, buyers yelling, haggling. So how can you pray in that situation? We, we often on a Wednesday night with Illuminate will say to the children, you know, let's have some quiet time so that we can pray together. And actually getting that quiet, calm time so that we can pray, as we all know, is the, is the way you, you want it to be. But how could you pray or meditate with all of that rabble effectively going on. So, the Jews, by allowing the court of the Gentiles to become this place of trade, had effectively closed the door of the temple to the Gentiles, and that angered, quite rightly, Jesus. We then look at the fact that it had become a den of thieves. So, a den of thieves can be a place where robbers hid themselves away for those that were searching from them. could also refer to a place where robbers hid waiting for their unsuspecting victim to pass by. Back to days of Dick Turpin and highway robbers where they would pounce on the, uh, those unsuspecting. But, like robbers, the high priest and his followers had hidden themselves away in the temple, um, seeking to hide their wickedness under a cloak of holiness. Like thieves, these men were waiting to foolish, the foolish to enter the temple so they could make their money. So while you can argue that the sale of animals and other items used for worship seems harmless and even helpful, we need to understand it was anything but innocent. People coming to worship had been charged grossly inflated prices. The money changers were just as guilty. They inflated their exchange rate. High priest and his family were paid a percentage of the profits on top of the rent that they were paying. They had a captive market and were taking advantage of it. Had they been doing this away from the sanctity of the temple, I doubt Jesus would have interfered as market forces would have dictated the price. However, in the temple, trading and making a super profit on holy ground was entirely unacceptable to Jesus. The righteous indignation Jesus had for the fact that the Jews had lost all respect for the holiness and sanctity of the temple and treated its grounds like it was any other place. The house of God had become looked upon as a convenience to be used as a person saw fit. When Jesus saw the Father's house being treated this way, he took measures to make this right. So how did the chief priests react? Clearly the people were amazed when they saw Jesus, what he'd said to them. No doubt many of the people that day were sincerely trying to worship God, but were there being fleeced by the very people who should have been there to lead them to the Lord. They were interested in what Jesus was trying to do in the temple because they were tired of being taken advantage of by the high priest and the, his followers. <coughs> Chief priests, having seen this, feared Jesus and were seeking a way to destroy him. And we all know, because we've just watched the video, what will happen in, as this week progresses. The Chief priests had defiled the temple. God was offended and judgment was coming. The lesson for us in this, for me, is very clear as I start to wind this up. We can be people God will bless, or we can be people God will judge adversely, which we are de will determine by how much we love him. Because we, how much we love him will dictate how faithfully, fully, and fruitfully we will serve him. God can either use us in his church for his glory, or he can find him a people who do love him. Seems to me that the Lord wants us to know that he is not playing games. His business is serious business. It's high time his people treated it that way. The whole issue in the temple was a problem of the heart. The Jews had abandoned authentic worship. Modern society has a similar problem. Many have abandoned authentic spiritual worship for something more convenient, for something of their own making. 
all the while, authentic worship is exactly what we need to strive for in the church. When the Word of God is read, we should hang on every word, seeking to absorb it all. When we sing, we should open our mouths and sing. When we listen to singing, we should seek to find God in the words. When we hear preaching, we should seek God's message for our life. Empty worship was the trouble at the temple the day Jesus visited. Empty worship brought divine judgment to that temple. What does he see when he looks into the temple of all of our hearts? Where does this message find you tonight? Are you saved? If not, come to Jesus. He will save you. If you are, has the Lord spoken to you about your commitment to him? If he has, come to him today. He loves you and he wants to use you in a special way. He will if you will follow him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for sending your son to us and him for the ultimate sacrifice that he paid with his life, Lord. Take us now, Lord, as we go this evening, as we fellowship together, as we eat together, bless the food that we are about to receive, Lord, and um, guide us as we go through this week. These things, Lord, we ask in your precious name. Amen. Could we all stand together as we close this part of this evening by singing Because He Lives. Life 